in charge of implementing the Food Safety and Standards Act of India. At the districts, you have the designated officer and the educating uh, officer. Uh, the educating officer decides the penalty and what should be done. And uh, in the third tier, we have the food safety officer who does the inspection of the uh, food businesses and the food business uh, operators. And also we have the food analyst. And that is all of you who are very uh, important because you will see that your results uh, will dictate whether the person uh, has to pay penalty, whether he has to go to prison or what. So it is very important that you know how we do these uh, legal uh, analysis. Okay, so the food safety officer is a very powerful person. Okay, so uh, he is uh, just like our traffic cops, you know, so just take. So he can take any, he or she can take any uh, article of food, inspect an FBO, uh, see that they maintain the hygiene uh, of the uh, uh, premises, and uh, uh, they are meeting the regulations and they do not contravene the uh, regulations. So he has the liberty to uh, go and pick up the uh, samples. Um, and they can also, they can also uh, destroy uh, any perishable product or so which they find uh, is a risk and uh, is against, is in contravention of the FSSA uh, regulations. Uh, this happened in Delhi. Okay, so uh, you are not food safety officers, but I thought you should know that the food safety officer also, there is a protocol by which he, ca he, has, he can pick up the sample. It is not that he just goes and he says, I'm going to take this sample and get it analyzed. So when he takes the sample, he must have a witness with him for taking the sample. He has to take the signature of the uh, FBO on all the forms. We have different forms, uh, numbers which he has to do. He has to also give in writing uh, his intention to the FBO in form 5A that he is going to come. And he must take the signature of the FBO. If the FBO refuses to sign, then he takes uh, a witness with him and the witness will uh, sign, he takes the signature. So this is how the uh, FSO takes the uh, sample. And basically, uh, the reason he takes uh, official, uh, when he takes the official sampling, actually it is the FSOs who should be attending uh, sampling training programs because the food safety officers should know how to uh, sample the uh, birthday. So he is supposed to take a sample that represents the food which is uh, sold to the consumer and he uh, also divides it, uh, in, as we will see, uh, into four parts before he sends it uh, to the laboratory. He must see that the sampling does not alter the integrity of the sample. Uh, I do know that in Kerala, the food safety officers have now been empowered uh, with the ice uh, uh, buckets and you know ice things so that they can pick up uh, the samples for microbiology and so. But I do not know of any other state which is following uh, the principles for picking up the samples uh, aseptically. But uh, we need to do that. And he also knows how. Uh, he also should know how to store and transport it to the laboratory. Okay, so if you see uh, this, this is the flowchart for the analysis under our uh, FSSA. So he informs the food business operator and uh, in all the forms, he takes either four samples, if it is a packaged food, he has to take four samples, or if it is a loose food, he takes a representative sample and then he divides it into four parts. So when he does the division into the four parts, all the four parts must be representative of the primary sample. But when it is a packaged food, it is there. All of them must be from the same lot. They must have the same batch number and they should have the same manufacturing date. Among the four samples, one sample in form five, he sends it to the public uh, health laboratory, that is the state public health laboratory. 
The second and third sample he sends to the designated officer for safekeeping and it has to be stored in the correct conditions. And the fourth sample, on demand of the FBO, the FBO has to demand. If the FBO doesn't have confidence in the analysis being carried out in the public health laboratory, he can ask for the fourth sample to be sent to an NAPL accredited laboratory and FSSA has notified about 85 laboratories which have been recognized to do this analysis. So two samples are kept with the uh, designated uh, officer. Okay. And um, when the reports come, uh, uh, analysts from the state public health laboratory sends the report to the designated officer the designated officer makes a decision whether to it is in compliance or it, if, if it is in contravention of the FSSAI Act. The, and he informs the food business operator. If the food business operator appeals against the uh, results of the public health or the food analyst laboratory, based on results that he has got on, uh, from the NABL or so, then the designated officer can decide and send the laboratory, send the sample to the referral food laboratory. And the analysis of the referral food laboratory is final. So we have uh, now we have notified several referral food laboratories. Some of them are specific commodities. Okay, some are for specific commodities, and some are for all the uh, commodities. So the referral laboratory uh, will also analyze the uh, samples. Right. Okay. So here, um, the topic is handling of the FS analysis of FSSA samples. So this applies to all the three, that is the NABL accredited laboratory, the state public health laboratory and the regular food laboratory and from now on I call them all the three as regulatory laboratories. Okay, All the three are involved in the regulation just to see because the sample handling and analysis is the same for all the three laboratories. Okay, So the authorized, the food safety officer is uh, responsible for collecting, holding, sealing, storing and delivering the sample in a manner that will prevent it from being changed after sampling. Who is the authorized officer? I told you about a designated officer and I told you about the food safety. The authorized officer is the officers who are in the ports, that is the port of entry for import, that is in the airports and in the seaports. So they are called authorized officers and not designated officers. Whoever receives the sample in the laboratory has the same responsibility as that of the uh, food safety officer. That means uh, they have the responsibility of collecting, holding, sealing, storing and keeping the sample without uh, uh, it being destroyed. You know, the sample integrity must be uh, maintained and it must be documented. Okay. So when the food safety officer takes the sample and he sends it to the laboratory, he must, uh, there must be a code number on the sample. There should be the name of the sender with the official designation and signature. There should be the date and place of uh, collection. The nature of the articles being sent for analysis must be uh, written on the container. And if any preservative is added, okay, so they need to write how much a preservative has been added. So generally the milk samples, they are adding formalin so that the, uh, it is preserved. So he has to write whether formalin. So here it is 0 0.4 ml for 500 ml of milk. So you can see on this container, it has a code number, the name and designation, the date, uh, of collecting, of course, the place collected, uh, natural torment. This I have just simulated. Okay, so analysis of all these official samples are carried out by either the NABL accredited lab, which is recognized by FSSA, or the food analyst state public health laboratory, 
or the referral laboratory. So these three are the laboratories that carry out the uh, analysis as per the FSSAI. Okay, so what are the uh, key elements for the best practices in a reference laboratory? One is, first thing is the sample security. So the sample has to be secure, and I will tell you about the security. The second is the sample accountability. From the time it arrived in the laboratory till the analysis was done and how it was uh, destroyed. So that accountability has to be there, both for the individuals as well, as well as by the places. The third is the sample integrity. That means there is no cross-contamination, no deliberate uh, uh, adding or removing, and the integrity of the sample is the same as that it, when it arrived. The fourth is the chain of custody, as Anne uh, thing mentioned, you have to have a chain of custody from when it applies. It is who is responsible. At every point of time, the sample has moved from the custo uh, sample custodian to the lab, you know, to the waste disposable. So we should have a chain of custody. We should be using test methods, which are fit for purpose methods, and which are all international methods. So uh, as I go along, I will tell you we have the methods. Data integrity. So how do you maintain data integrity? How your lab notebooks are maintained and how you should write in your lab notebooks. The data retention and the data reporting. Data reporting is very important over here because you give an opinion. So you give an opinion as safe, unsafe, misbranded uh, or substandard. And depending on these words, the penalty is uh, there for that. So you have to be sure when you're saying which is unsafe. You have to differentiate between unsafe and substandard or misbranded. So you need to read a lot. Actually, you need to read a lot about uh, things because there is so much coming up on uh, this. Okay. So sample accountability. So what is sample accountability? It ensures that the official samples, all the test samples for a uh, portion are all traceable, okay? So the life of the sample should be documented until final uh, disposal, including all the test samples and the test portions, how you disposed uh, the, them. Then sample integrity. So when the sample arrives, you have to see that it is maintained and stored secure and how it is handled and transported. When we talk about storage, it's not that you say, you know, it was stored in the sample room. You have to note down the temperature, you should note down the relative humidity, and you should have documentation for the temperature and the relative humidity. If you have stored it in a refrigerator, you should have documentation for the temperature of the refrigerator. If you have stored it in a freezer, you must have the documentation of the uh, temperature of the freezer. Because you must remember that all this is for physical evidence in the court. Okay, because when you go to the adjudicating officer, he is going to ask for all this. And our lawyers are very smart. So, you know, they know what to ask for and what not to uh, ask for. So, uh, you should also have uh, uh, SOPs for your laboratory waste disposal, the workflow layout, all this can affect the cross-contamination. And as I said, you should have supporting records for everything that is carried out, right? So let's just take, for example, the storage, as I said. So you just can't say, I stored it. So frozen samples, they must be maintained at minus 28 to minus 18. Refrigerated samples from two to eight degrees. And when you're storing at room temperature, they must be protected from heat and uh, moisture. Okay, and the location, temperatures, uh, location, room number, refrigerator number, everything has to be recorded. The security, this is very important, right from when it enters the building. Okay, the physical security of the uh, sample is very important because you don't want any intention, intentional adulteration or substitution of the uh, sample. And it is sure that the sample, what you got is a representative of what was uh, collected. Okay, so physical security, 
most of the referral laboratories, I don't know, but I know as uh, the uh, referral laboratory, we have building security. So nobody can ent enter the building unless you know, they are authorized to enter the uh, building. Protection of the official sample. So you have the sample receiving room. So that again, uh, you can only enter by your uh, ID or uh, thing. Visitor control, no visitors are allowed into uh, these regulatory uh, laboratories. Document security, you have to have measures of how you uh, keep your thing. And also you should have security of controlled substances like absolute alcohol, sodium cyanide, the platinum dishes that you use and things. So these are a few examples of the physical security that is required in a regu regulatory laboratory. So what are the controlled areas in uh, the regulatory laboratory? One is the sample storage area. Okay? So only an authorized person can enter the sample storage area. The solvent storage area where, for all this, the alcohol storage area, radioactive material, the PCR room when you're doing DNA base, the document room, the computer room, and the mail room. So here access is limited. And it is cleaned only in the presence of, in normal working hours and in the presence of uh, the custodian. Then there should be card readers or security locks and all the entrances are uh, secured. These are ideal conditions I'm talking about. And since most of the state laboratories are going to get upgraded, you know, uh, with the FSSA is giving you money, I think you should look into putting all these into place if you, you know, want to be considered as, you know, a, what do you call, a sample or a regulatory a laboratory, right? The chain of custody, as I said, all this uh, thing, these laboratory samples are physical evidence, okay? So a chain of custody form is a mechanism of tracing the lineage or the accountability from the time of uh, collection through reporting, okay? And all this comes under ISO 17,025. It's not that, you know, this is something different from a regulator, for a regulatory laboratory as of the, all of the, this comes under ISO 17,025. Probably they use different words. So, but it is the same uh, Then physical custody of the uh, sample. So who is it? So there should be someone who is designated to receive the sample, and only that person can receive the uh, legal samples. And there should be, in case he is absent, who will take care. It should not be that the custodian is uh, on leave and so all the samples are not uh, accepted, okay? So only those who are designated for custodial role may, uh, may receive the sample. And it is his responsibility, his or her responsibility for receiving physical custody of the sample and starting the uh, original record of sample. Actually, if the laboratories have the LIMS, that is the Laboratory Information Management System, then this becomes uh, very easy and uh, simple because you could have a LIMS for that. But we are just now upgrading and hopefully in the second phase you will be able to have the uh, LIMS. Uh, you need to all get NABL accredited first and then we will, uh, after upgradation, uh, NABL accreditation, and then you will, uh, we will think of the limbs. Okay, so flow chart for analysis. So here is the flow chart for analysis. So you receive the sample from the uh, food safety officer or the designated officer. And all of you know, here in this case, the sample will come usually by uh, registered uh, post and thing and a memo comes separately, okay? So it is received in the regulatory uh, laboratory and the first process is documentation. After documentation, it's analysis and report. But all through the flow of the sample, the security, integrity, and accountability is uh, most uh, important. And then you have the analysis, which I will uh, go through. So this is how, I mean, all of you are from public analyst laboratories. So this is how a sample uh, package is received, the outer cover of the sample. So as I said earlier, it will have the code, right? 
So the code will be there from the FSO. Uh, it will be wrapped with waterproof paper. It will have seals and you will count the number of seals uh, that are there. It is a secured uh, wet thing. And at the bottom, you will have uh, the designated officer, his designation and his signature. Okay. So name generally because the DOs uh, change, the names are not printed. Okay. So as I said, when we go back, the first thing is the uh, documentation. So once you receive the sample, it is the documentation. So here is just an example of the documentation that can be carried out. It's not necessary. You follow this. So we have a serial number, the date of receiving, the DO, uh, FSO code number, the number of outer seals on the parcel, whether the seals were intact, if they were not intact, you give the details, and where you have stored it. Custodial storage, whether it was an ambient freezer, refrigerator, so you give where it was, and you have the name and signature of the sample custodian. So here is the sample receipt record. So we have started the chain of custody. Okay, so throughout, again, it's accountability, security, and integrity. And when you're doing this custodial storage, it is always good to use a checklist. Okay, make a checklist. This is a sample checklist that I have made and we used to use this. So you have name, designation, signature, date of parcel. So these will tally with your uh, register. So normal leakage, covered, not covered, packed in wooden box, intact outer seals, without seals, number of seals, details of custodial storage, place and temperature, uh, name and signature of thing. So you can always develop a thing. Uh, you can add to this checklist if you want to be, your documentation has to be a little more. Okay. Then you have the parcel opening. Okay. So now documentation, although we have this, most of the referral laboratories or everything, we have the CCTV camera when the parcel is being opened. Okay. So it captures uh, how this our sample is being uh, opened. And remember when the sample is being opened, it could be the custodian who is there and it must be op opened in the presence of a second person. Okay, It is never opened just by one person there. It is always opened in the presence of a witness over there. So again, date of receiving, code number, parcel opening date. You give a laboratory code number because you know you uh, these numbers are all confused, you know, you have so many numbers from different states or so. So you give your laboratory code number for what it comes and name and signature who, of the person who is opening the parcel. So for this, again, accountability, security and integrity. So uh, in our system, you know that when we get the parcel, we do not open the parcel till we get the memo. Okay, so it has to be in storage and the thing. So once the memo comes, then you look at the seal, okay? And then you document whether this seal matches the seal on the outer cover of the parcel that has received. So you have a method of documentation. And if you see, we had something where, you know, once it was opened, we said, Seals were intact and unbroken. The seal sticks from the container and cover tallied with the specimen seal and impression which were sent. So this you keep as a record, but we have also uh, documented it. Right? And then you can have a checklist. Okay? So this first part is what we used uh, in the other one. It continues. And then you have conditions of the inner contents of the parcel. So you could make it, we made it very exhaustive. Okay, as a referral laboratory, we made this checklist very uh, exhaustive. So we have packing material, what packing material was used, sample container, conditions uh, of the seal, number of seal, does the seal compare with the uh, thing? And then number of samples, in, because sometimes the DOs have the habit of sending more than one sample in a parcel. So they, you know, they send two or three samples in one parcel. So 
you know, you have to be sure that you record you have received the samples, code number, uh, signature, date of sampling, any other observation of significance, then your laboratory code number and the parcel opened in the presence of, that is the witness name and signature. So we have got all the evidence, even in the court, if it says, and plus we have the footage of the CCTV uh, camera in the room. Okay. So next, the sign, the chain of custody, it goes to the uh, lab, right, for analysis uh, from the custodian. So you can have a sample lab transfer register, and you can note down uh, what you see over there. And in the system. If you cannot analyze the sample, I mean, if you find that the sample is unfit for analysis, you have to note down the reasons it was unfit for analysis. This is just an example that I have uh, given. And you uh, inform the uh, food safety officer. So the time frame for analysis of the food samples, the regulatory samples are, if you find it unfit for analysis, Within seven days, you must inform the food safety officer or the designated uh, officer, and you can ask for the second sample, so so that uh, the FSO or DO will send you the uh, second sample. So the time frame, if it is fit for analysis, is five days for imported samples, and fourteen day. I mean, pub, uh, health laboratories. I, I, 14 days. It's the same as referral laboratories. Okay. So referral laboratories, it is 14 days. If you cannot analyze the sample in 14 days because of the breakdown of the instrument or you have the sample load is very high, you know, too many things, then you can always inform the FSO or DO that uh, you cannot send the report in uh, 14 days and you give the exact time that you're going to uh, send the report. Okay, uh, and immediate action should be taken if you find that there are conflicting sample numbers, sample seals, name, uh, breakage, leaking, putrid uh, thing, you inform, okay, uh, that. Now, in the laboratory, uh, the sample, the regulatory sample as such when it receives, sometimes it has to be split uh, when you do. So there are two ways of doing the intralaboratory splitting. And this must be documented, OK? So if it is like one um, imported samples as such, especially when you get to the frozen chicken or frozen meat and things, you have to do the microbiology. Uh, they generally do not send you, you know, two things. So you will first send the sample to the microbiology lab so that they can take the sample for microbial analysis. And then it goes to the chemical lab. If there is enough and it can be just split into two, then you have, uh, you can send to microbiology. And the method by which you're doing this, you know, you should have a SOP uh, for that and it must be uh, recorded. Next, now you have got the sample. Analyst has the sample. You have to carry out the uh, analysis as per the FSS rules and regulations 2011. Basically, you have to look at the packaging and labeling. You have to look at the food product standards and the permissible limits of the food additives. You have to see about the prohibition and restriction on sales. And you have to analyze for contaminants, toxins, and uh, residues. OK? So, OK. So if you look at our laws, we have FSSA laws are mandatory. We have to follow the FSSA laws. But there are some commodities in which we have to follow BIS standards. Can anyone name what we, uh, which, uh, which one? Which water? Packaging. And? And? Milk. Infant formula is BIS uh, standard. So they all must have the ISI mark. Okay, so you have to see if the water that you're drinking, this packaged drinking water, has got the ISI mark or uh, not. Okay, and you also in certain commodities we must have ag mark. Can anyone tell me in which one we must have ag mark? Blended oil. You need blended oil must have ag mark. Okay, all right. 
So this is then, of course, we have voluntary standards which we do not test for in the regulatory laboratory. So it's very important you know for which ones it must be ISI, for which it is uh, AGMARC. Okay. So now uh, is the packaging and labeling. So we look at the labels. One of the first and foremost things is the label, the name of the food must be in English or in Devanagiri script. Okay, so if you get a food like this, any imported food, you don't even need to do the analysis. You can say that it is non-compliant to uh, the FSSA rules and regulations because it is not in English. Then you have the, a list of ingredients must be there in decreasing order. Then nutritional information must be present. You must have veg or non-veg symbol. Okay. And this is unique to India because no other country, you know, has this mandatory veg and uh, non-veg. So most of the imported things do not have this symbol, although do. Then declaration regarding food additives. What are the declarations you will look for? Okay, right. Color, natural color. So some examples are contains permitted, now if they have added color, contains permitted natural colors, synthetic food colors. But you have to see whether those commodities color is allowed. If you look at the appendix, table one to table nine, it tells you, uh, appendix A, you, you, I mean, you will find whether it is there. So added flavor, natural flavor, it has, uh, it's a thing. Then you need uh, the complete name and complete address of the manufacturer, net quantity, lot number, date of manufacture, best before and use by date, FSSAI logo and uh, license, country of origin if it is imported, instructions, of course, this is not necessary, you cannot fail if the instructions are not there. And we have some product specific requirements, as I said, the ISA, uh, ISI and the uh, AGMA. And there are some restrictions on advertisement. That means on the package, if you find things, uh, words such as super refined, ultra refined, pure, all that, these words are not allowed on the uh, food uh, packages. Okay. Uh, in addition, uh, and some you have labels for, you have product specific requirements, okay? So if it's packaged drinking water, they should be crush the bottle after use. Uh, in uh, infant food and uh, the baby milk powder, it, you sh they have to write mother's milk is best for your baby. Uh, if it contains polyols, they write polyols have. So you have to read all the rules. You know, it is a long list, but you need to uh, read all the uh, rules and see whether it has a uh, thing. Uh, among the latest is, uh, especially in mixed masala, earlier they used to write that it is just fried in edible oil, but now they have to write the name of the edible oil that is used. Earlier it was just fried in edible oil, so now they have to give the uh, name. Right. So here are some uh, packages. And you can tell me whether these are correct or wrong. And then I will tell you. So the first one, it says ultra pure. So it's not the thing, you know, it could be their company thing, but that is not there. The second one, it's wheat. So what is wrong in that? It's actually misleading the consumer. That I want on the wheat atta. Huh? No, MP wheat is okay. Madhya Pradesh wheat, tell me. Right, tell me what is it. Yes, 100% atta and 0% maida. So you cannot have atta without maida. Okay. So it is actually misleading the consumer that it doesn't contain maida, but actually uh, it is there. Uh, what about this one on the biscuit? No, 10 essential vitamins is... Yeah, but that is okay. What it says, pro, why is that wrong? Protein of one glass of cow's milk is equal to protein of 100 grams of biscuit. Why is it wrong? Because when you say it is non-compliant or it's misleading, you have to give 
uh, a reason. Tell me why. No? Protein may not be equal to that one No, he says it's a, you can test that. Okay, you can test for things. Tell me why it is wrong. See, if you look at milk protein, the PD cast, that is a protein digestibility corrected amino acid score is one. It is a complete protein. Whereas the protein in biscuit has a PD cast of 0 0.47. Okay, because wheat protein is actually lacking in lysine. And so if a child eats biscuits instead of eating milk, he will not get the complete protein. Okay, so if you see, this is misleading because a customer, instead of giving milk, could give only uh, biscuits. Okay, 100 grams of biscuits. The last one, added fiber, healthy age digestion. Yeah, that, that's correct, actually, because it is an ingredient uh, claim. Okay, so added fiber, healthy age digestion. So that is an ingredient claim because we know that fiber uh, aids uh, digestion. Okay, so those three and these are wrong. There are some more misleading uh, advertisements. Sugar-free digestive, zero sugar. So, because when a diabetic patient sees sugar-free, they think they can eat the biscuits, but the biscuits have got carbohydrate, which adds to the thing. So even zero sugar. But on the other hand, you have another packet which says no added sugar, no added. So, you know, they know that no sugar is added. So some of these are misleading and you have to really be thorough with your uh, biology or your biochemistry to uh, see this. Excuse me. Yes. Whether any lab give a misbranding report again? I don't know all that. This is my thing, what I have looked at. <laughs> And as a consumer, I have written to these companies. So, <laughs> uh, thing. okay. So the analytical methods that you use, as I said, they should be fit for purpose uh, methods. And we have to use the FSSAI manuals, all the, the 13 manuals, the latest microbiology manual will be uploaded. Or you can use the BIS methods, which are all ISO methods. Or you can use the AOAC test method and thing. But the FSSAI manuals, actually you, in the manual, it is the AOAC or the AACC or the uh, AFA uh, methods which are described, but in a much simpler language than what is in the uh, thing. Because if you see at the end of every method, we have given a reference and the reference is there. And very often I have seen NABL assessors you know, they say these referral laboratories or regulatory la laboratories are using FSSA methods. They are not using, uh, pre, you know, uh, standard methods. So you have to tell them that these are all standard methods. They are AOAC or AAC, but only the language has been simplified. If you check, almost all the methods are traceable to one of uh, these international methods. So we need to use fit for purpose methods. So le let's take the example of, you have received this sample for analysis. So this is a sample of ATA which you have received. So if you look at the standards, it falls under 2.4, that is cereals and cereal products. Then you look for where does ATA come? ATA comes under 2.4.1. And then you look at the specifications for ATA. So it says ATA or resultant ATA means the coarse product obtained by milling or grinding clean wheat free from rodent hair excreta. It shall conform to the following standards. So it says moisture, not more total ash, ash, insoluble, gluten, alcoholic acidity, and everything. So because every lab was doing different tests, you know, each lab was doing a test of their own and, you know, uh, kind it. FSSA has now, if you've seen, they have put out the test methods which have to be done for each of these commodities, for all these commodities, right? Up to 2.13 and under 2.30, uh, these 13 categories. And so let us see for ATA. And you will tell me how many of you are doing all these tests, okay? So you need to do the general parameters, okay? Look for... Uh, the musty odor, acidity, you must test for antioxidants, preservatives, natural colors, synthetic colors. You will do the quality parameters, 
that is what is given, moisture, total ash, ash, insoluble gluten, alcoholic acid. What else will you do? Okay. And how many of you are doing in ATA? No? Pesticide residues? Should you do pesticide residues? Huh? No, I'm asking, should you do uh, pesticide residues, MRLs? Yes or no? I can't hear. Everybody must tell me. Yes. Yes. How many are doing? How many labs are doing? Okay. Right. So we need to do metal contaminants. We need to do naturally occurring uh, toxic substances. Uh, here, actually, Dawn should be uh, included. Okay. Uh, pesticide residues. So you see, we have this whole list. So there are no microbiology uh, standards given. So for ATA, you have to do all these tests okay, uh, and see whether it conforms to that. If you have packaged, say, I, uh, the packaged uh, vegetables or frozen vegetables, I think, you will have the microbiology standards. So I have actually differentiated in red and blue. So why have I done this? Can anyone tell me? What do the top three uh, show and what do the bottom show? Bottom show fully out Full? Quantitative. No, there's no quali qualitative, it is quantitative. See, the top three tell you the hygiene in which it was there. The hygiene, it tells you whether they were prepared in you know, ISO 22000 or HACCP and thing. And the bottom are the pathogenic uh, organism. So we need to do all these uh, tests for the microbiology. And as you see, it's absent in uh, 25 grams. So you have to do the testing. So you have to test for qual general parameters, quality parameters, uh, contaminants, food additives, food preservatives. Okay. So all the tests have to be done for uh, a regulatory uh, sample. And once you're doing the analysis, the documentation is uh, most important because uh, in the court of law it is your notebook which is actually you know um, the judge asks for the notebook to see how it is so documentation is very important I'm not going to uh, go through it I'm sure all of you know that it is safekeeping uh, the organization and readability and the quality of the record keeping which is uh, very important and uh, the best practices are you have to have a detailed sample uh, description, the chain of custody for the sample, all the analytical information, quality control data, your raw data, all the attachments that uh, you have, the commercial labels, and of course the good record keeping uh, practices. So physical characteristics, uh, generally in the laboratory under ISO and 17,000, we use large bound uh, thing which have numbered pages and which we have acid free uh, paper and of course duplicate pages there are dif different opinions in the west we have the duplicate pages i don't know whether you have because when i was in the us in my own research doing research we had whatever we wrote on the first page was duplicated and it would be uh, kept as uh, things so it is not necessary as long as you are there the uh, record keeping, uh, document and version control on your register, you know, is it volume one, volume two, or thing. Very clear writing annotation, the, what you write, there should be logical thing. All your pages should be numbered. There should be no missing page. All unused uh, areas should be lined out and uh, dated uh, across the book. So that is uh, data integrity. All errors, you have to put a line through. There is no using white ink or uh, thing, clearly. Uh, after cutting it out, you have to uh, sign. No correction fluid, correction tape, no blacking out. And they are all recorded in ink. There is no uh, pencil use. And in my experience, even a felt, using a felt tip pen is quite bad because by chance, if water gets on it, it uh, thing. Uh, quality control. Uh, equipment, what you used, the identification number, if you're using petri dishes, for example, lot number, lot number of the chemicals you have used to make your reagents, lot number and date of uh, preparation, 
the quality control of the standards, the quality control of the microorganisms, you know, uh, all uh, things, raw data, um, detailed sample prep, calculations including formula, standard prep, all dilution, test conditions, if you deviated, why you deviated. So it's best to record uh, all this. Uh, these are all very ideal conditions. So uh, you should have as an attachment your instrument printouts, computer generated data, must have the sample number, okay, so about the sample uh, information and on every attachment. Uh, at the top you should have a page number, uh, unique sample ID, uh, initials and it should be sequentially uh, numbered, okay? Ethical and legal issues. Uh, the laboratory owns your notebook. Uh, you're not supposed to remove your notebook from the uh, laboratory. Uh, do not take original pages, um, minimum five years. I think that was under PFA because many of the cases under PFA would take five, 10, 15 years and they were never solved. But whereas in under FSSA, maximum is three months, uh, which uh, it gets cleared. And generally, uh, as in ISO, the technical manager should have signed your uh, book. So here also we have the signature. And uh, this is how you're reporting. So you report in the form A. This is for the referral food lab laboratory, but you have for the public health, you have the other form, okay, form B. Okay, and so you fill this out. What I want you to think is that here we give the reasons for it being unfit. The sample description has to be as detailed as possible. Okay. How it is colored, everything. Uh, physical appearance and the label. The label must contain all that which I had listed in the uh, checklist. Okay. Next, continuing, you give the serial number, what is the method you use, the result, and what are the prescribed standards, um, what is given in our regulation. Next comes this, which is most important, okay? Your opinion, uh, what you give. So unsafe food, anything which contains poisonous, deleterious, anything which contains filthy, putrid, rotten, if it's processed unhygienically, See, addition of substance, abstraction of any constituent. So this whole list, so you have to understand. And sometimes it is good to discuss with each other because everybody interprets the rule in a different way. So it's best two or three of the, uh, doing the analysis, you try to interpret and see. Because when you give your opinion, you have to say it is found unsafe according to, you know, that ZZ, something one, two, three, four, five, some we have. So you have to give the correct uh, opinion. Misbranded, false misleading claims, name which belongs to another article, fictitious individual company, imitation, misleading statement, country which is fault, no declaration, uh, incorrectly uh, uh, stated. So you can uh, think. And substandard, is an article of food, which is, is something, you know, your protein is not, if we say 12%, so you get 10%. So that is substandard, okay. If the moisture, we say, should be 15% and you have 16% or 17%, that is considered substandard as well as unsafe because something can grow with the uh, moisture. So this opinion, you need to spend a lot of time in uh, giving this opinion, unsafe, safe, and uh, okay, and then finally you need to have a documentation of uh, when you have done it, how you have sent the report, and thing. And you keep all the documents, including the memo in the parcel, the letter. We generally keep even the parcel covering, you know, that um, uh, cloth seal, everything we keep and uh, we pin it together and keep it with the file name till the, you know, especially for non-compliant, okay, especially for non-compliant samples, we uh, do that. Yes, I think I've done, so I finished in time. <laughs> okay.
stand for that. I have a question about uh, you mentioned when you are opening that that package, you need CCTV take the camera. So do you uh, take this video as a technical record? Yes, we do. Because uh, you know, from the other side, if uh, it is non-compliant, you know, they can say that it is tampered with in the laboratory. So therefore, we have evidence that. Right from the sample with the seeds, it's with us, so we open it. That's a new practice. You mean never, but you also should do it. Because, see, uh, the first physical evidence or anything is they're going to call the public analysts, okay? Then you will be called as well as the reference lab will be called. So, uh, because sometimes uh, experience has said that Public lab gives, uh, you know, it carries the sample with the one parameter and the reference lab uh, fails in another parameter. So we, it, there is a little bit of mismatch between uh, public uh, health laboratories and referral laboratories. So at that time, we need to have uh, both the reports. Is it really to give the photograph? Yeah, photograph is fine. Earlier we were doing that. Now that CCTV camera has come, we are doing it. Earlier we, we, we had the video, you know, one small video, somebody would hold it and they would do it. Now we have the CCTV camera. Yeah? So. so I hope now, you know, all of you will do the uh, reference, uh, regulatory samples uh, judiciously and do all the tests that are uh, because what happens is we are finding that, you know, 50% of the tests are not done. So you should do all the uh, tests that are there. And to make it simple, everything has been listed by, how many of you have downloaded the document? Where all these parameters are given for all the uh, 13 groups. Huh? Commodity by commodity is what analysis you have to do. You should have a copy. Yeah. 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 No, see for the batch number or anything, when he gives it to you, you put the lot number and batch number, right? So if there is some uh, thing, he will send it to referral laboratory. So referral laboratory also must have the same lot number and the batch number. So if the same lot number and batch number is not there, and definitely the educating officer or the lawyer who, uh, for the uh, opposing party, he will definitely look at all that. You, you are having only one sample. You have only one sample. No, no, he, no, he cannot. <laughs> he has to look. He has to say it. Another question. Uh, if the uh, samples uh, conform to the standards, how many days we have to keep the sample? The thing, yeah. I just say for being, uh, no, generally most of the samples are perishable. So because they are perishable, you say that you know they have been discarded. So as for the, uh, if you are following this, I think seventeen thousand twenty-five. You have the thing of how many days you have to the sample. No, there is no particular thing. But you are, we are assuming that you have got ISO seventeen thousand twenty-five, and in seventeen thousand twenty-five there are different kinds of perishable for packaged food and things. Other questions? Uh, in fourteen days, we have to analyze the data. Uh, you have to submit the report to the respective DO. And you know, whether they are uh, working days or... Uh, <laughs> That's a decision. Everyone asks, uh, you can assume. I assume it's 14 working days. So, uh, Saturday, Sunday... It's very difficult. Only four days coming... I think it will be, we will model, uh, We will take that up and we will make it. Because there is a lot of this, uh, you know, doubt in the language that has been used. But I think we need to be very clear that it's 14 working days or 14 days, uh, it will all be made clear. Because there was 40 days, uh, the PFA made a lot of days, Yeah, because, see, in uh, PFA, you know, I can tell you 1998 cases are still not closed. So you have 40 days, but uh, in FSA, that time is... 
design that, it was the same as the data. But uh, uh, since three months is the uh, time for uh, taking the sample and to give the education, the educating officer to give his opinion, I think it is. But uh, you know, it can be a uh, thing done. How many of you give it in 14 days? Let me see. <laughs> huh? How many of you give all your sample results in 14 days? No, no. How many of you give all the samples that come to your lab in 14 days? I don't see a single no. hand. <laughs> yeah. One more thing, ma'am. Is it is mandatory to declare E number for uh, flavoring substances? Identical flavoring yeah. substances? E. E number or the name? Okay, yes. but uh, due to uh, some uh, competition factors and the trade secret, most of them is not giving that E number for identical flavoring. No, according to our uh, thing, it says they have to tell you what because it comes in the list of ingredients, right? Anyhow, so they have to be taken. You might have seen that uh, most of the companies are not giving right now. So if you are taking the case of Maggi, that seasoning, uh, they are declaring that uh, it contains some identical natural flavoring substance, but they are not declaring that E and But the FSSA look into that matter. No, but the FSSA will not look. No, first of all, the public laboratory health laboratories have to go. They have to report first. Report and Madam, is there any possibility of asking sample for, uh, as evidence in court? Uh, in court prosecutions are actually in some great cases. Okay. They ask for the. Uh, no, if, the DO, uh, if the DO has the court sample, he will take no. it. But you have the you have your uh, SOP, no? How many days it will keep? And you always say it's perishable and it cannot be kept. So the changes will occur. And, but in some cases, the police if they see some sample, if they send some analysis, so they ask for the, uh, uh, the physical sample to submit. In some cases, no. Yeah, if you have it, you do, but generally what uh, we have assumed is we say that all the sample has been used. So, this one we have to <laughs> But uh, you have to be, in, because uh, in my thing, I never, I was never called to court, so I did not do that. Excuse me, madam. Excuse me. Madam, how many samples per month? Uh, one food and is supposed to. Because we are forced to clear up to 300 samples per month. That's up to each food uh, commissioner. I, know. I don't think FSSA specifies. There is no regulatory thing like that. No.